Hello, my name is Chris Kurzik, and I'm the Principal Engineer at Athabasca Engineering Solutions, AES for short. And uh, what does AES do? Well, first of all, we provide third-party value evaluations. We provide training and certification. We provide equipment re-rating. The outline. These two presentations, part one and two, the outline will be as follows. There'll be a purpose of refractories, some background and some buildup about refractories. There'll be the chemical composition discussions, refractoriness, the term will be introduced, thermal conductivity will follow, physical forms of refractories, and an overview of API 560 based upon everything we talked about before. In part one, we will do with these sections shown here. Our presentation will be based on API 560 section 11 refractories. And um, basically, the refractory industry is a huge industry, and it's dominated by the steelmaking industry. So there's a lot of terminology that may be a bit confusing for, for uh, when selecting materials for the use for fired heaters. And fire heaters themselves have a lot of different applications. Now, there's, you know, there's the complete combustion, which is traditional. Um, approach which is part of um, you know API 560 the basis and then there's there's incomplete combustion combustion um, associated with the development of syn gas and those have those are running really hot right and so we have thermally resistant they have to be these materials have to be thermally resistant to heat and protect the casing from high temperature damage. So they have to be able to withstand high temperatures without melting or becoming soft and starting to deform. Uh, they have to be corrosion or abrasion resistant. And if you look in chapter 11, there's other, other properties like repairability and so on. And um, there's a really good definition of what a refractory is. It's ASTM C71. But, you know, if you really want a high boil down type of definition, it's basically anything that operates all equal or greater than a thousand Fahrenheit kind of thing, 538. So refractories in themselves are, are inorganic, metallic, they're, they're porous, they're heterogeneous materials. They're composed of thermally stable mineral aggregates. They have a binder face to keep everything together and they have additives. The principal raw materials used in the production of refractories are normally oxides of silicon, aluminum, magnesium, so, uh, calcium and zirconium. Zirconium is used for the high, high temperature applications. And there are some non-oxide refractories like carbides, uh, nitrides, borides, silicates, and graphite. So there's a lot of chemistry here. They're, they have to be resistant to heat exposure at different degrees, uh, and they have to have be able to have the mechanical properties that, that you require. They have to have um, be able to have some thermal stress and strain ability, and they need to have be corrosion resistance um, and erosion resistance from solids, liquids, and gases, and gas diffusion, for example, as well. And they have to have a mechanical abrasion at various temperatures. Say, for example, in a fired heater, there's soot, which can cause a lot of damage to a factory. And another big feature, a requirement, is thermal shock resistance. So if there's rapid changes in temperature, uh, you know, during heat up or, or, or something like that would ch result in a sudden change, sock change that has to be resistant. And it, of course, it needs to be dimensionally stable so it can't, you know, expand when um, minimally 
the very, very minimally to zero if it's possible uh, during the heat up and cool down and to, you know, to protect the, uh, um, the stresses from thermal expansion. Now we're going to go back to high school and look at the periodic table of elements. This is not an absolute guide, but it kind of gives you a bit of a roadmap where you're going in terms of, um, you know, the elements that are used in refractories. And we're going to talk about composition, first of all. And so if you go to the left, we've got a group here. They're called basic materials. And, you know, the, the big ones there is magnesium. And um, that's used a lot. If you see that in the chemistry of the refractory, chances are it has a, a basic chemistry. And you would use for for environments where you you require you know basic um protein resistance second group is a neutral group and and some of the key ones here are you know is chrome and aluminum and then over here is the acid group and the acid group has silicon over you know over there and um and carbon and 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 so those are are elements that have a big influence on um, the refractory chemistry so corrosion resistance Corrosion resistance is extremely important in steel making. I, I, my background when I first started working was in the steel making industry. So we used to make different types of steels, uh, everything from irons to stainless steel to manganese. And so uh, chemistry was a big deal in steel making, especially for steel making because the slags can penetrate or wet the brick and it, it mean it, it uh, can cause the material to, to degrade and if it's if it's not compatible so they, they came up with something called a V ratio and it's actually quite a complex equation a lot of a lot of guys will take the the first element which is the calcium oxide and the silicon and they take that ratio and they simplify that thing. Um, but I mean, if you want to be exact, exact with computer modeling nowadays, you can you can have more accurate calculation. But basically, um, if your V is less than one, then your slag material is acidic. And if you're greater than one, then you're basic. So uh, for, for a fired heater, you've got ash, which is typically acidic because it's got sulfur in it and you've got condensate so you can have ash and condensate dry or wet and you're going to get acid so typically your fired heater will be an acid but again that has to do has to do with the composition of the flame uh, if you're using a lot of natural gas right then it will be different and if you're using um, you know, like uh, off gas from the refinery or other types of gases or hydrogen, then then it will be different. So it needs to be, you know, assessed. Um, other factors which, um, you know, which is part of the corrosion resistant consideration is, is porosity, the density, because if you have holes, then you know, the, 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 the gases can penetrate into the refractory. But as you'll find later, that porosity is a really big deal with the design of refractories because they provide, um, you know, like insulation ability, the air pockets inside um, reduce the conductivity of the, of the refractory. And so that's really important.
So let's let's get into basic refractories. I've thrown a couple microstructures here, you know, because I am a materials person, so I, I, I like doing this stuff. So here's your chrome ore, and here's your mag manganese, magnesium oxide. So you basically, uh, re refractories, as we saw in the periodic table, um, they're they're very resist they're used for basic slags like dust and fumes at elevated temperatures because the higher the temperature the more reactive um the gases and the dust and the fumes and the slags will be um on the refractory so you'll want to match up the the chemistry so magnesite um and magnesia are very common basic uh, fundamental building blocks of the basic refractories and uh, if you add some chromite or chrome or it's also called then um, you'll you'll change the properties again but it's done and um, lime or calcium oxide is also used and remember where it was on the periodic table and sometimes they'll use uh, they'll add even onto that or in combinations of these a, a dolomite and um, and then sometimes they'll even add carbon, as I meant, we mentioned earlier. Neutral refractories. Basically, neutral refractories. The most common is is uh, alumina when the concentrations are greater than 50 percent it's a little bit confusing because there's other types of aluminum in, in other and in, in other types of uh applications and and so but generally if you're greater than 50 percent alumina then you have you're classified as a neutral refractory uh, they also can add uh, chromic oxide as we mentioned earlier and carbon and uh, what's nice about it is it's chemically stable uh, to both acids and bases. And the grades uh, can come in 50 to 99%. And I believe that's mostly due to the fact of uh, for thermal stability. Now let's go to acid refractories. So acid refractories typically have silica and, and uh, th it has another name, it quartz, and but it's got a very high concentration of silica. And, and so, and that's to, to make sure that you're in the acid. So an acid brick will have a lot of silica. The, the image in the background, by the way, is a picture of the silica, um, you know, brick that's used. You can see all the little spots. That's sort of an indicative of a silica type of brick. There's also zirconia. And it's, of course, it's more money, but it's for higher temperature applications and it's like for glass making. And then there's another class of materials called alumino silicate refractories. And uh, the equation is shown there. It's sort of a combination of alumina and silica. So here you go. Here's a case where you have your alumina, but it's at lower concentrations and it can be used for acidic uh, applications and, and and remember if you go back to the periodic table it's sort of on the edge between a neutral and and then and uh and the acid type of refractory so um you know this is where you use it where you have an acidic atmosphere you, you can't use this for basic conditions because the refractory will be become uh, attacked by say if you used a basic in that environment, then you'd have a problem. How do we measure the refractoriness of a material, which is how much it can handle the temperature? Like what's the rate of temperature? Well, it, there, the industry has something called a pyrometric cone test, and it's used for all kinds of like for kilns and so on. And I have an image here of the PCE, 
and um, basically you have three material three little tooth like shapes and and the one in the middle is what you, what you need and basically there one's like a guide so that's like a reference the other one is, is sort of a shield to to make sure that you've got a typical one but basically um, it's all found in ASTM C24 and it's important because um, the the lower quality of material you use the more this cheaper it gets so uh, and so you you only want to use the high temperature application where it's required and so you you have low duty which is somewhere between 19 and 28 and you can you could ask for these type of testing to be done to make sure you've got the refractory you need there's intermediate duty there's high duty 30 to 33 and then there's the super duty okay so um so the refractoriness of the material is is sort of measured by by this type of test now there are three types of thermal conductivity classifications there's a non-conducting which is silica and alumina you've got conducting silicon carbide zirconium carbide and then you've got the insulating class of calcium silicate kaolin zirconia onwards through thermal conductivity insulating materials have different degrees of um, porosity and so uh, if you want a high degree of insulating ability then you want a lot of porosity and, and the key to being insulating material is is you need to have the porosity evenly distributed so uh, classified as a heat resistant material is anything less than 1100 degree centigrade 2000 Fahrenheit refractory is hotter than that it's in the 1400 degree centigrade range and you'll find your your cables or your your fiber materials are some are classified as officially as a between a heat resistant and refractory steel or, or sorry uh, refractory uh, insulating material and then there's a high one which is less than 1700 centigrade or 3000 and and that's where you're starting to melt you know steel at that temperature already and and those are called the high um, highly ther you know thermo thermally resistant materials and then you have the ultra high which is special applications and that's where you're you're going to about 2000 degrees centigrade or less and um you have to look at the materials by the manufacturer because they'll have a rated and then they'll have a recommended temperature for your limitation and uh, but if you use this terminology with them then you're you'll 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 be off to a good start I hope that you found this presentation useful and valuable to you. This was provided by Athabasca Engineering Solutions. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and your thoughts on further videos. And we'd love to hear from you. Maybe we can do some business. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing. Take care for now.